the heart of the material world, we see this constant process of giving and receiving. It's the chemistry of life. It's life itself. And we need somehow to connect that initial tentative perception of the meaning of reality to the personal level of experience. In other words, to allow the inner and the outer aspects of our self, of our consciousness, to merge and become one. And Gregory of Nyssa says, you have within yourself this capacity. You have within yourself the means by which to apprehend the divine. It's this harmonizing of the inner and outer levels of the self that allows us to find and live meaning in a secular age. It's what ultimately restores meaning to that phrase, I love you, God. And the way we do this work of harmonizing the inner and the outer is called prayer. But to understand what prayer means in a secular age, we have to expand and deepen our understanding. We have to make sure, as never before, that there is no white magic left in our prayer. I was talking to somebody in Ireland recently, and uh, she had just lost her glasses, and uh, she was looking all around for them. And she said, don't worry, I'm going to ask St. Anthony. St. Anthony will find them for me. He always finds them, always finds what I've lost. So I said, oh, it's great. She said, yes, I offer him five euro. <laughs> and I said, what happens if he doesn't find it immediately? She says, then I offer him ten. <laughs> she said, then he always finds it. And she had this, a twinkle in her eye. Because then she said, because St. Anthony likes money. <laughs> now this was a good Catholic. But she had quite a lot of the white magic of the pre-Christian Celtic imagination as well. <laughs> including the little leprechauns <clears throat> with whom St. Anthony was being confused, I think. I don't think St. Anthony of Padua ever imagined he will be confused with the little leprechauns of Ireland who, of course, traditionally love money. Hide it under the rainbow, don't they? The pots of gold. Well, that's okay as far as it goes. But I don't think that kind of folk religion, in a sense, is going to communicate the message of the gospel in a secular age very effectively. Listen to what Origen, great second century father of the church, says about prayer. It's a wonderful short definition, timeless definition of prayer. He says, we do not pray in order to get benefits from God, but to become like God. Praying itself is good. It calms the mind, reduces sin, and promotes good deeds. We do not pray to get benefits from God, but to become like God. Theosis, divinization, that was the catchphrase of the first four centuries of Christian theology. God became human so that human beings might become God. St. Peter, we are called to share in the very being of God himself. That doesn't mean to say we are God, it's not polytheism, but we do come to share by grace, by gift, in the very being of God, because we have that innate likeness to God in our own nature. And praying itself is good. It's one of those things that is good in itself. You don't have to justify it socio-economically or psychologically or in any other way. How many things can you say that about in your life this evening? 
It is good in itself. I don't need to justify it to anyone on any other grounds. It is good in itself to pray. But it does have benefits. It calms the mind. Calm minds are good minds. They are clear. They make right judgments. It reduces sin. That means it diminishes the power of the ego to distort us and to lead us into self-centered action. And it promotes good deeds, which means that as the barriers of the ego fall, uh, we become more capable of being channels of the divine love. Even though our left hand may not know what our right hand is doing, what we do becomes good. John Main said that when we meditate, we are accepting the gift of our own being. We are being empowered by the gift of God's self in Jesus to accept, first of all, that gift that he gives us of our own selves. And it is this receiving of the gift that takes us into the transforming experience of God's love in what we call the movement of transcendence. That is, the lowering of those barriers of the ego, or, if you like, the dropping of the conditions under which we will negotiate the gift. In meditation, in prayer, as Origen is describing it, or contemplative prayer, essentially, we drop the negotiating stance we have with God, five euro or ten euro, or whatever it is we are asking in return. We drop the conditions that we place on the gift, on the gift-giving experience and the gift-receiving experience, which is at the heart of prayer in the heart of all truly human living. The dynamic of spiritual experience in this process is that deepening of emptiness. Because remember I said, if you think about what happens when you have, have ever received this gift of love in your life, been touched by the gift of another's self, the effect on you is an emptiness an opening, a clearing, not an increase of your possessiveness, but the empowerment of you to give in return. So the dynamic that we find in meditation is the deepening of that emptiness. Another word for that is poverty of spirit. That's the key theological concept we have to understand if we are to begin to understand what love means and, in fact, what meditation means. It's poverty of spirit that makes the gift possible. It's poverty of spirit that makes the gift receivable. It's poverty of spirit that enables us to receive and hold the gift without possessing it and allowing ourselves to be empowered to make the gift of ourselves in return. And this is what we mean by the love of God. Macarius the Great in the fourth century says, once one has experienced the taste of God, one can never be satisfied. And we can never have enough of it. But however much one is enriched by its wealth, one still feels oneself to be poor. The gift, in other words, never becomes a possession. Not yet, not yet, neti neti, as the Upanishads say. Emptiness is fullness, fullness is emptiness. Love is this gift of self, and its essence is boundless. Once the ego's barriers 
and conditions are lowered, then we are in the infinite expansion of God's love. The ego naturally sets out to prevent its own transcendence. The ego doesn't want its boundaries lowered. It feels as if it's going to become extinct and with it our identity will disappear. This is the basic survival instinct. It's the dynamic at the heart of fundamentalism, the fear of losing identity in contact with modernity. And the ego comes up with all sorts of reasons, some reasonable, some silly, for not entering into this process. The sillier the reasons get, the closer you know you are. When I became a monk, I had to give up smoking. And I put off the moment of giving up until the day of my novitiate. And then I just went cold turkey, I just gave up. And I went through quite severe withdrawal symptoms. All sorts of reasons came to me to just have one more cigarette or, you know, it wasn't such a big thing and God wouldn't be angry with me and nobody else need know about it. And then the ego addictive mind came up with its final ridiculous attempt. It made me feel guilty at betraying an old friend. <laughs> and it was a very, very powerful feeling of guilt and shame. Cigarettes had been such friends to me for so long. <laughs> but when I saw that, that the mind was able to come up with something so ridiculous, I was free of it. In meditation, in learning to meditate, all sorts of reasons come up for not doing it. The most ridiculous is, I don't have time. I just don't have the time. I would really like to meditate, but I'm too busy. Once you find yourself saying that, you know that your ego has got to the end of its good arguments. When you feel that you can't make the response that we make in meditation to the gift of God's love, that love that comes to you from within, penetrates you, and then radiates out through you, when you find that you just can't receive that gift to accept the self that is being offered to you continuously, what can you do? All you can do, and everything you can do, is to surrender into your own incapacity, into your own weakness, and to turn it into poverty. Poverty is, you remember, the condition of receiving a gift. So just become poor. Don't try and receive the gift, because if you're trying to receive it, you're probably trying to turn it into a possession, be in control, set conditions for it. Tell God how you would like the gift wrapped. When I am weak, then I am strong. <laughs>